Okay, we are, oh, forgot the recording. All right, we are happy tonight to have Miss Susan Purvis speaking with us. Let me see if I can get. So GOMI is an organization when we strive to create an educational platform where interested students and healthcare professionals can explore and interact with wilderness and emergency medicine. We strive to showcase the diverse spheres in which physicians and healthcare professionals can make an impact and inspire others to think abstractly about the ways in which we can utilize our careers in healthcare and medicine. And we also want to create an international community of wilderness medicine enthusiasts and experts committed to promoting a diverse and culturally competent environment. We like to showcase people and spheres from all over the world and get people inspired and excited about wilderness medicine. Before we begin a little bit of administrative lectures, if you haven't already, please join our mailing list. We have bi-weekly lectures, amazing wilderness opportunities, fellowship showcases, certificate courses, and so much more. We have a lot of really cool, interesting stuff coming down the pipeline. So if you're interested, please scan the QR code with your phone and join our mailing list. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube at, at G-O underscore W-M-E or our website at www.gowme.org. You can also watch our prior lectures and share this lecture with people who couldn't make it today. We do have some upcoming events for students in the Northeast. There is a Mid-Atlantic Student Wilderness Medicine Conference that will be hosted October 14th and 15th, which is a really good opportunity to network, learn a few things about wilderness medicine and take some workshops to really. And these are our upcoming talks. We are currently with Ms. Susan Purvis on September 21st. We will also have a talk about search and rescue in the National Park Service. And there's a few more talks down, down the line until the end of the semester. Something new this year is we are sponsored by Pit Viper. So every lecture you attend gets your name entered into a drawing to get some sunglasses or a hat or a fanny pack donated by our sponsor. And now we'll get down to it. So today our special guest is Susan Purvis, who will be giving a talk on wilderness medicine in the hottest, coldest, and highest places on the planet. Wilderness medicine specialist Susan Purvis learned in the early 2000s that if you want to practice medicine in extreme environments, keep your bags packed, don't ask for much money, and be professionally flexible. She'll be the first to say, I'm not a doctor, but she knows a few things about taking care of patients. She worked slopeside at an urgent care clinic at the base of Mount Crested Butte, Colorado for over a decade. Over the past 25 years, Susan's built a rewarding career anchored in gold exploration, search and rescue, ski patrolling, guiding, wilderness medicine and avalanche education. As a wilderness medic, she's led several successful education programs, ex expeditions and teams to the hottest, coldest and highest places on earth. She currently trains elite special forces in winter mobility, avalanche and wilderness medicine in the mountains of Utah, Idaho and Montana. She's a public speaker, wilderness medicine and avalanche educator, owner of Crest Butte Outdoors, and author of the best-selling and award-winning adventure memoir, Go Find, My Journey to Find the Lost and Myself. Susan received congressional recognition for saving lives in the high country of Colorado with her naughty but lovable Black Lab Tasha. Her exploits put her in Smithsonian, Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, on CNN, the BBC, and Discovery Channel. Susan lives on Bitterroot Lake near Glacier, Park, Glacier National Park, Montana. Visit her website at www.susanpurvis.com or www.cboutdoors.com. We are honored to have Susan talk with us today. So without further ado, I will turn things over to Susan. Hello, everyone. Hey, that sounded pretty good. I must be a writer. I wrote that. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thanks. Um, let me get started with the screen share, and I'm so codependent on my slideshow here. So um, welcome, everyone. So exciting to be here. So everybody can see that, and you can hear me okay? Good? Sounding okay. Good, looking great. So I'm going to make this interactive. So if you have questions, you can just unmute yourself and, you know, just say, hey, because I can't see everybody. Or if you want to just put it in the chat, Jess or Katrina will moderate that. Um, so I'm going to be asking you guys questions and we'll see how it goes. Um, I I probably got over ambitious with my talk. So, you know, depending on time and how everybody's feeling, um, we might have to cut it short. 
And I just want to say it's what a delight to be here. You know, Jess and Katrina, you guys look like um, you could, well, you probably could be my children, but um, these are the, the, you know, the upcoming emergency room and trauma surgeon doctors. So it's a pleasure to be in your, in your space. And um, thanks for sharing this platform with me. Appreciate it. So what I want to do is talk about the um, wilderness medicine considerations. Uh, like I was saying, I've had a chance to work in the hottest, the coldest and the highest places on the on the globe. And so I want to kind of bring this back to you, either if you're a nurse or you're a medic or a physician and you want to get into wilderness medicine and expedition medicine, I want you guys to be thinking about preparedness, prevention, your the problems and all the anticipated problems. So as we go through this, I'll be asking you those questions. Um, how would you handle it or what are you thinking about? And um, this is the cover of my book, which I'll talk about in a minute. So just to get people on the same page, you know, what is a wilderness context? You know, we these kind of these three beats we teach is delayed access to medical care, hostile environments, and limited equipment. For a majority of you probably on the on the call here, you probably work in the urban environment, but you can see sometimes even if even if you're working in the urban environment at a hospital or an emergency room or a clinic, you could be confronted with any one of these three situations. You know, all it takes is an explosion or, you know, some sort of hostage uh, situation. And now you're down to limited equipment or you don't have further access to patients. Uh, this is a photo from uh, a film shoot I did with Nat Geo in Montana. And just by looking at it, you can tell there could be a lot of things that could go wrong in this on this expedition. So uh, if I have time, I'll come back and talk about that. <clears throat> so full disclosure, you guys. Okay, what does that mean? Uh, most of these are my photos. Um, these are, this is my personal experience uh, working in these environments. And, you know, like I said, I am not a doctor. I'll be the first one to tell you that I'm a an emergency medical technician with a wilderness module on that, but I did spend 11 winters working at an urgent care um, orthopedic clinic at the Slope Side in Crested Butte, Colorado. Um, when I talk about medicine uh, slides, they're from Wilderness Medical Associates. I've been working for them for over 25 years. Um, they are uh, the largest wilderness medical training organization in the world. Uh, I'm not here to pick on anyone, so um, hopefully uh, I don't offend anyone by what I say. It's just you know what I saw in my experiences, and I just wanted to say you know laughter. I love this lady. She's a friend of mine from the Kumbu of Nepal, and you know we we have to laugh about the things we talk about. You guys know you do very serious. We all do very serious things, and at some point we just got to laugh about this stuff because otherwise we're going to lose our sanity. So hello to all of you healers. Um, congratulations for the hard work you put in in um, managing patients and trying to heal people. Um, I just wanted to ask you guys, have you seen the latest research about diarrhea? Um, diarrhea is, um, oh my God, you guys, I just forgot my my what I was going to say. Um, Oh, diarrhea is hereditary. Have you guys been reading about that? No, and not anyone? No one's raising their hands? Well, the research um, shows that you can find it in your genes. Okay, it's a joke. That's the only joke I'm gonna tell tonight. Okay, we gotta lighten this um, show up, right? Peely thought that was funny and she's not even a doctor. She's the only one who got it. Okay, moving on. So, um. Well, here I am in the hottest place on earth, but I just want to do a quick moment of silence, you guys. Um, just take, close your eyes, take a deep breath, you know, unwind from the day and just be, you know, thankful or grateful for something. Just, you know, love yourself, ask for help. Maybe you need to say a prayer for others. So we'll just take a few, you know, a few seconds of our moment of silence. Okay, so even in the most extreme environment, um, those are all camels in the background, by the way. Um, this man at noon is praying to Mecca. I mean, you just gotta love it. They just do a timeout from their really hard work and they're, they're gonna pray. I just love that. 
Okay, um, like I said, I'm an author, an explorer, and an educator. So I'm gonna just kind of break this up into three parts and kind of go down this path. And um, and I'm also a youper. Now you're probably going, which one's a youper? Well, a youper is really a geographical spot in the United States. So it's the upper peninsula of Michigan, we're called youpers. So I grew up on the Southern shore of Lake Superior. So do I have any Midwestern, Western folks in the um, audience here? Um, Jonathan and, Thompson in the chat says, go mighty mitten. Yeah, yay. Anybody going to school or gone to school in the Midwest? So you can see this is um, a far cry from the hottest, the coldest and the highest place. Although sometimes we get to be the coldest place in North America. All right. In the chat, we have an MSU medical student and Christopher Davis is originally from Michigan. We also have an MCW student in Milwaukee and a WSUSOM alumnus. So we have a lot of Midwesterners. Hey, I knew it. That's why I stuck it in there. Okay. So um, this is not me in the third grade, but when I was in the third grade, I always knew I wanted to write a book. And I never had the confidence or competence to do it. As a matter of fact, I flunked out of high school English, sort of, you know. So um, in, when I was growing up in the 70s and 80s, I graduated, just to give you a perspective, I graduated from high school in 1980. That's when Outside Magazine came out. And I so badly wanted to be a travel journalist. And I wanted to go on all these adventures and write about it. But I never had the confidence to write. So I had to do something else to make money. I just didn't want to be a poor creative, you know, how those folks are. I mean, right. So I, I had to go make money. I never gave up on that dream. You know what, 45 years later, I did uh, finally tell the story that was worth living. And this is me coming from Northwest Montana to the Javits Center in New York City. The publisher never told me, but my book is one of the six books on the front of the, the Javits Center. So my my adventures and my uh, search and rescue career in the high country of Colorado went on to becoming a best-selling and award-winning memoir. So yay, don't give up on your dreams, even though it took me, you know, 40 or 50 years later. Not bad, right? So all you guys going to medical school, you know what? Just hang in there. So what if it takes you 20 years, right? Not an option. <laughs> okay, so how back in the late 70s and 80s, there were no really women role models working in the outdoors. I mean, what were our choices? I could be a nurse, but I didn't want to work in a hospital. Secretary, no, I didn't want to do what my mother did. And then there was the other option, maybe a school teacher. I just didn't want to work inside. So, you know, I'm like, what are my options? Well, I ended up going to the school, uh, school at University of Montana and I became a geologist. So these are stromatolites in Glacier National Park. This is primitive um, algae mats that gave us life on earth, really. We can talk about that later. So I became a geologist and I knew I can make, you know, quick, fast money doing a ge um, geology. But before I got a, um, my big girl pants on, I became a survival instructor. I wanted to know um, if I could live off the land. So I did, um, I was a survival instructor in the Idaho and Arizona desert for two years. I would work for 21 days straight. I'd make $1,100. So I remember that. And then I'd go take off and travel the world, usually on my bike or hiking trips. And then when I ran out of money, I'd come back and do another trip. So I did this for two years. And really, all this set me up for success in my life because I knew if I could live off the land, I could probably do just about anything. So then I finally, uh, I met my husband and he was a geologist. So we started managing um, a gold exploration company in the Dominican Republic. So this was my life bushwhacking through the jungle. It was dangerous, difficult conditions. I, uh, I was really kind of unsatisfied there. And I felt like life was passing me by. This was not my purpose or my passion. I really just did it for money. And I didn't really know what else to do. And so, um, you know, I just remember screaming up at the sky saying, I've got to make a change. And the change was I had to get this little puppy. So I was 33, year old, three, 33 years old and I did this huge career change. And I thought, oh my God, what am I gonna do with this puppy? Because um, 
we could commute from anywhere. And I lived in the last great Colorado ski town. Does anybody know what it is? <laughs> Crested Butte. So this is a view of Crested Butte, Colorado. And I, so I had one foot in the snow and one foot in the mud because I couldn't give up my day job in the Dominican Republic. So I commuted 2000 miles, but it was here. I said, what if I made a living on my skis? So I, I work, I got a job working at on Crested Butte Ski Patrol, which usually um, at the time, there's only five other women. This was in the mid nineties. Either someone had to die or um, I don't know, to get a job. It was a coveted position. So in order to become on ski patrol, I had to get my EMT license and I decided to join search and rescue. And while I was working on ski patrol, a orthopedic surgeon came up to me and said, Hey Sue, you're on ski patrol. How would you like to work at my urgent care clinic? Right at the slopes of one of the gnarliest mountains um, in Colorado. I mean, people are just creaming down the mountainside all the time. And that's when extreme skiing was really taken off. So, I mean, people just came in broken and busted. So I ended up working at this urgent care clinic for 11 winters. And this is really where I, I got a lot of my um, training from. And my, uh, just so, you know, um, Tom Moore, the orthopedic surgeon, he would always lean. I didn't know how to do anything, right? I was green and I looked for rocks for a living and he'd be like, Sue, you know, medicine isn't rocket science. Rocket science is rocket science. I should know I, I am one. So Dr. Moore was a rocket science with a PhD ready to go into space when the Challenger blew up. <clears throat> so he became an orthopedic surgeon instead. Um, so he just let me practice medicine there. And over the you know 11 years, I probably worked with 20 different practitioners and uh, I learned a lot. So this is, you know, ski patrol training. Um, and I did all this just so I could be this someday. I wanted to be a search and rescue dog team that saved lives. Okay. And I was really going for my avalanche certification, but I'd learned along the way that there was more to it than just working avalanches. So why did I choose that? Well, here's my backstory. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a, a woman in a small mountain community with a huge, and I had to cut my own path. There was nobody else doing what I was doing at the time. So I'm showing you this photo. So this is me or my girlfriend. I don't know if Nicole's on the call here. She's a physician assistant in Bozeman. Is Nicole on the call? <laughs> this is her if she's here. But that see that hillside that's in the shade behind her on the other side of the valley? Well, um, that faces east, okay? And you see there's condos below, right? So when I was, got to Crested Butte and I first uh, was starting to learn about avalanches, avalanches just come down and clobber anybody either on the ski hill or in this case, in an urban setting. So this is outside the ski resort, but what I learned was that hillside, this is it, came down on a uh, Sunday morning on a bluebird day Three toddlers were outside this condo playing when this uh, dad was putting luggage in the shuttle bus to bring him back to the airport, to bring him back to Houston, Texas, when this wall of snow came down and buried all three toddlers. And I was listening to this story that happened six years prior in, in a similar storm. I mean, it was like snow in 100 inches, winds were 50 miles an hour. And I was leaning in going, oh, my God, an avalanche came down and buried three toddlers. I couldn't believe it. And so um, I said, then what happened? And he's like, well, people, you know, there was no intact search and rescue team at the time. So people just grabbed, you know, pool hooks, you know, broom to find these kids. So two of the toddlers were found within six minutes in respiratory failure. They were blue. CPR was conducted on them and they survived, but they couldn't find the third toddler. And I kept leaning in saying, well, then what happened? The patroller said, well, we brought over our trained avalanche dog. And I'm like, really? You had a trained avalanche dog? <laughs> and they go, yeah. And I go, well, did the dog find the human? And they go, no. And I kept saying, why not? Why couldn't the, the dog find the human? And they couldn't answer me. And it was in that moment, I thought, hmm, well, what if I got a dog to train it to save lives? 
vowing to never leave anyone behind. So that was my my big promise, the promise, you know, and I'm writing about all this in my book. Um, <clears throat> so that set me on a trajectory. And you guys know in who are in medicine, your trajectory is huge, right? You guys are all on a mission and no one's going to get you off your path because it takes so much willpower and determination and confidence and you're getting beat down at every turn and you just got to get your pants back on and go to battle every day. Would that be a true statement? I would say so. Yes. <laughs> so I'm here. I'm your cheerleader here tonight. Okay. So we ended up getting certified in wilderness, uh, air scent and trailing, um, the water avalanche. And then we also, um, looked for homicide victims, human, you know, we were human remains detection. Uh, dog team. So we worked your round. So um, if we have time, if you guys want to hear about it, I I put in some slideshows about avalanche medicine. You know, once you find somebody, what are you going to do with them? So if uh, you guys want to hear about that, why don't you, uh, you can put it in the chat box. Yeah, avalanche. And I'll make sure I cover it before my time's up. <clears throat> okay. Um. This is, a, this is a mission, the pinnacle of our entire career, where I had to put all those disciplines to work. I'm getting flown into um, 13,000 feet in the San Juan Mountains to look for an avalanche victim who was involved in a plane crash. If you guys look way down here, you see that there's a little where my mouse is. That's a human cutting out a helicopter pad. And I have one hour to find the avalanche victim. Um before it gets so dangerous. So three years into the writing process, because writing a book takes a long time. By the way, uh, put in the chat box if you want to write a book, because we've got a few writers in the in the room. I know them. Um, three years into the writing process, I finally figured out what my book was about. And I'm just going to tell you, because it's just not about our search and rescue missions because that's really all I wanted it to be until I wrote this three years into the writing process. I said, how come it was easier for me to jump out of the side of a helicopter at 13,000 feet with my avalanche dog in my lap to find a dead guy than it was to talk to my husband about our 18 year relationship together. Ooh, mic drop, boom. So that's really what my book's about. So I have to go explain all that. Okay. So that's my my authorship. Let's talk about, uh, I, I claim that I'm an explorer. Well, I used to call myself an adventurer. And then I joined the Explorers Club, which is the Explorers Club. There's only about 800 women. Um, and they said, well, you know what the difference between an adventurer and explorer is? And I'm like, no, I don't. And they go, well, an explorer has a purpose. And I'm like, I guess I'm an explorer because I go to these places with purpose. So here's our first case study. Let's get into it. Ready? So imagine, especially you women on the call, I can't tell how many men are versus women are on the call, but this is the email I got. Okay. So it could also be female physician. I think I get hired all to these places because I'm inexpensive and I'm professionally flexible. Remember I, I said that. So um, you doctors can't get away for a month, right? So make sure you become professionally flexible. So this is what they were asking of this person they were looking for. And by the way, I usually get called at the last minute because everybody else is canceled. So I'm, I'm like the, uh, uh, the last ditch effort. So I'm here. They're looking for someone to be a presenter and talk about medicine in a science documentary that it's going to end up on the BBC and discovery channel. So, um, I said, sure, why not? So let's just go into, so what, one of the things we're gonna do is go down to this 2000 year old salt mine in the hottest place on earth. And also we're gonna go visit these toxic fumaroles, okay? I don't know much about, you know, what we're gonna do. So what do you guys wanna know? Somebody can just shout out, like you're gonna be the medic on this. Um, you're in charge of, we didn't really know. I'm going to tell you the facts here. 24 days, 
22 Brits. Let's see, not only is it the medical problems and the environment, but now you're dealing with, uh-oh, British people. No, I shouldn't say that. I'm just kidding, right? <laughs> two Americans. I'm one of two women. Okay. You know, you can just see this is, you know, we're going to have trucks, two tons of gear because it's filming. It's all about the filming. 30 camels, 24 FR warriors. Oh, and this is really what happened. 22 cases of diarrhea. And someone said, well, how much does a case of diarrhea weigh? <laughs> I thought that was so funny. So what do you guys want to know? What, you know, preparation for you personally, and then as a collective, you're the medic. And you guys, you know, when you, you can bring, you know, you can't fly that much stuff to where are we going, by the way, Ethiopia, we flew into Addis Ababa, we're going to another commuter town and then the Danakil depression is 15 miles away from the Eritrea border oh by the way and they're at war and a year ago some United Kingdom folks got kidnapped and killed so you're starting to pile up okay not only are you doing the medicine but then you have group dynamics a place that was at war it's super dangerous okay why am I going oh I know because it's fun right this is what we do nobody else would uh so Let's hear, um, let's hear about your thoughts. Maybe prevention, what are some of your anticipated problems? What's gonna kill these people first? So in the chat we have, Jonathan wants to know what the health of the participants are before we leave. Jenna would like to know access and egress, medications available and extraction points. Rachel would like to know what your extraction plan is in case things get really bad. And Jenna also wants to know what your support is for evacuation, like if the military is behind you. Wow, those are great questions. Anything else? Yeah, and you know, since I'm coming in so late, they've been working on this for over a year. Um, so that really wasn't my job, but these are great questions. And I think one of the reasons why they invited two Americans is because uh, the US has a military base in Somalia. So if kind of shit hit the fan, maybe <clears throat> the military helicopter could come and get us. Uh, but you're we're out there in the middle of nowhere. I mean, best case, you know, I'll show you some of the pictures, but these are all great questions. I didn't know. I just went. Um, so again, you know, we kind of cut it off at the knees. I can't, well, you can't let anything happen. Right. And we're dealing with all these toxic gas, hydrogen sulfide, chlorine gas, um, dust. What else is going to get us? Um, carbon monoxide from, the, the fumaroles and then the common medical problems. I mean, are you guys worried about heat exhaustion and heat stroke? So just to re reminder you guys, um, what do you die of say when you die of heat exhaustion? These are all great questions. We're gonna keep medicine really simple here. Anybody have a, a yeah, it's probably a dehydration problem, right? And then what do you die of when you die of heat stroke? What's gonna kill you? anybody so that would be brain swelling right brain failure right so of the two heat strokes going to kill you fast like putting yourself in a microwave right um so those are the things i'm thinking about what so if these are to the gases and then heat exhaustion and heat stroke what are some of the preventative things how are you guys going to talk to your the film crew and the talent what are you going to be telling them to do every day? Like what you teach, tell everybody in the clinic every day, right? Yeah. Like how many times do you have to say it? So I think really? I pulled everybody by the, the cuff of their shirt and I looked at them 16 times and said, listen, I want you peeing, urinating every two hours. If you're not during the day, you need to be peeing every two or three hours. So I'm going to just share this with you. What is the treatment for heat stroke? If someone can't thermoregulate and they're cooking their brain, they're at 105 degrees, especially cool. in the middle of nowhere. Cool them down as fast as possible. Yeah, well, you can't just say that. How? We're walking with camels. So do you, I put this photo in. I grabbed this off the BBC presentation, but you see, that's me in the blue shirt. What's on my hip? It was $2. This is like probably the most important thing I brought on this whole trip because I teach this stuff and I'm the only one thinking about it. 
It's a $2 squirt bottle. A spray Christ bottle. Christopher in the chat See says, it? mist water over skin and pass yeah. air over their body. Yeah, so we had a lot of wind. We had the fire wind too. So this became the most important thing in my toolbox. So, you know, my first aid kit is uh, that spray bottle. And I only had one. And then I could douche my nose with it because, you know, we got the fire winds and all this dust is coming at you. You can predict these, the medical problems as you go. And then people are starting to get skin rot and then they start to get respiratory system problems. And then we're getting gas inhalation and then all the dehydration and heat stroke. And then, oh yeah, by the way, don't drink the water in Africa, right? So I told these guys like, stay out of the water, stay out of the water, just try to bathe some other way, bring wet wipes. And then what do they do? They get in the water. I'm like, oh my God. And then, you know, the FR warriors, everybody uses the water. This is their lifeline, you know? And I'm like, oh, now you see why diarrhea um, becomes a, a problem. The other thing that happens in these environments is, um, you know, finally someone came up to me and said, Sue, uh, I haven't taken a crap in 10 days. 10 days, that's the longest I'd seen it in all the places I'd been, you know, because the the heat just dries you out so, so bad. So you guys, you know, what are you going to do out there? Did you bring the right meds? Um, yeah, you don't want to... My was at day six when he said day 10. So I was feeling a little bit better by myself, but, you know, I just realized all the stress and then the uh, lack of fluids really uh, binds people up. So, you know, we violate all these things where, you know, we didn't have a chance to acclimatize, um, you know, people, they've been waiting a year to go on this trip. They ignore their medications, maybe their illnesses or, you know, previous illnesses or injuries, and they just come. So these are some of the risk factors for heat illnesses. Um, and as you can see, we had a lack of wind and a lack of shade. This is considered the hottest place on earth. Uh, the American mine was there for two years and their daytime and nighttime two year average ambient temperature was like 36 degrees centigrade. And then when you work with film crews or people on an agenda, I mean, they don't do what the natives do. They're working all day long in the heat of the day, you know, and you're supposed to, you know, after noon, from noon to sunset, not be in the sun. So, you know, this is a really tough environment for us to do medicine in because everybody's violating all the rules. Um, here's just some, you know, shades nearly impossible. Uh, these are the nicely woven homes are from the old, the elders and then the youngsters they don't know how to weave anymore probably because they're watching mtv and stuff so they have these lousy little houses uh so that was really interesting to see <laughs> um we did have a physician on this trip and not to pick on physicians but here goes so why are the he was he was the first person to get sick out there why why do physicians get in trouble on the expedition taking care of everybody else and not taking care of themselves yeah right yeah yeah yep and you know it turns out he was a physician um for the rugby team in london and i'm like have you ever even camped right so these are all great questions to ask who's your crew um and not to pick on anybody but i will i you know i was a desert survival instructor. I was the only one who brought a sleeping bag on this trip because I knew it gets cold in the desert, even if you're in the hottest place on earth. And so um, it's, yeah. So now they're starting to shiver, you know, just the, you know, everybody's getting worn down. It's amazing. Uh, we made it through. I won't spend a whole lot of time on the, you know, the definitions and, um, here, I'll just, I'll just let you guys look at that. So this is heat exhaustion. It's really volume shock and you're overexerted. And this happened to me every time I went to the Dominican Republic from the Crest to Butte. Um, I had heat exhaustion almost every time I went because I just didn't have the time to acclimatize. So what's the treatment for this? You know, drink. So you're peeing every two to three hours and it's clear. So 
we can fix this. This is a field fix. Um, and I, I just took care of this all day, every day. And here we are, this is me scrambling at night trying to find something to take care of folks. Um, okay, and then heat stroke, this is the beast that'll creep up on people and kill them. I like to just say you're starting to, you can't thermal regulate, so your brain is over 105 degrees. You may or may not have volume shock. So, oh. you know, the treatment needs to happen right now. Hey, Taylor, my little buddy's on. So, um, immediate and aggressive cooling. So this is a great, the next slide coming up, uh, if you guys in wilderness medicine have never seen this, is, these are all from Wilderness Medical Associates. This is great. This is the latest research. Ideally, you would immerse somebody in ice water, but we didn't have that. Make sure they don't drown if you do that. Um, all, really, all I had was um, a spray bottle and wind. And they're saying it almost takes an hour and a half to cool somebody back down to norm, normal thermic temperature. Any thoughts or questions on that? Useful? Okay. So, um, sure enough, we're on the Eritrea Ethiopian border in the, near that war zone. And um, they, someone comes up to me and says, oh, let's see, I can't get up. I'm so sick. And I'm like, I need you to pee in a in a bottle. And they did, and it was, you know, brown. And it was like that much. And I'm like, hmm. See, where did you miss the memo? Why do you have brown urine? And this is not good, right? So he's in evacuation because now his kidneys are involved. And it turned out for this particular person, he was there maybe months before and got sick. And then he came back and he never really recovered. So dumb. So we had to do an evacuation and it was in a truck and it might have taken a day to get him to, you know, McLeay, the little hospital there. And, you know, now you're in some clinic in Ethiopia. He did come back out on the trip, but he wasn't looking really good. And those decisions are way beyond my control because he was a producer. Um, so that was kind of the big evac there. Um, ready? So any questions on heat before we go to some cold? And Mike's on the line here right now. He's the one who sent me to these god awful places. So we can pick on him. Okay, so um, I've done three trips to Antarctica, both off of each point. This one's, uh, I went in 1989 to McMurdo as a shuttle bus driver. I had nothing to do with medicine, but I was talking to these guys about my future. I was trying to get some advice from them. And they said, yeah, I think you, uh, you should go for it. My second trip, Mike, who's on the line here, he's with Catabatic Consulting. He said, two weeks notice in the dead of the Antarctic winter. He's like, hey, can you uh, fly to Punta Arenas and get on a ship to um, the Antarctic Peninsula in pitch dark and through the Drake Passage on this flat bottom icebreaker? And you're going to be the medic. I'm like, okay. So there I went. Um, Boats are nice because you can bring everything you want. And they actually had a, a clinic. So there was going to be 18 people on board. We're going to cross the Drake Passage in the middle of the winter through the Antarctic Peninsula to restock Palmer Station. And then we did this little side trip to the Ukraine, Ukraine base. So let's do some anticipated um, problems. What are you guys thinking about? What could possibly go wrong? The first two medic. things in the chat are, are not yeah. related to, to anticipation, but Jenna would like you to know that she worked at Scott Base, and Mike Taylor says that he loves you, Sue. Um, Jenna also says things to anticipate are frostbite. Okay. So, yeah, this is, so we're going to, so you can worry about frostbite, but, you know, we're going to be on that because we're on a boat. What else? So you're going, you know, the waves can get 60 feet high, through the Drake Passage and- jo Jonathan says motion sickness. Yeah, uh, so what, you know, anybody, what would you carry if you were gonna carry something for motion sickness? Jonathan says Zofran. Okay. 
um, own Dan's or Quell's have also been put in the chat. Okay, um, so this one kind of seems easy, right? You're just going on a boat. There's, you know, there, there's hardly anything that could go wrong. Well, I went into the clinic and um, what I realized is they had um, lice shampoo, lice deodorant, lice powder, lice dishwashing soap. And I'm like, oh, we're on a boat. Okay, well, that can't kill you. But um, that was just really funny because I guess it spreads on boats. So that was really like my only um, anticipated problem. But really, what um, the only problem we had was when we went to the Ukraine base, the Ukrainians hadn't seen anyone in seven months. So they threw us a party. And um, so you can imagine what happened at the party. One of our crewmates, I think, ended up drinking 22 shots of vodka. Well, the nice thing, we were on this big ship and they have a crane. So we got all lowered in dinghies and went to the Ukraine base. And then <clears throat> I laughed because it was a bunch of men, you know, I'm like, this isn't going to be good. So I went back to the main ship and then I get a call five hours later saying, Sue Purvis, can you come to the deck? And um, so they're bringing up, hauling up this unresponsive kiddo, 22 year old in the um, dinghy. So how do you manage, what's the treatment for unresponsive alcoholic on a 300 foot ship in the Lamar channel of Antarctica. Great question. What are you guys going to do? How are you going to manage that? Start by securing their airways so they don't aspirate. Yeah. And I'm not going to, um, and so if you're going to say that, what would you do on that ship to secure the airway? Let's be specific. Are you going to intubate them? Can't. Christopher Davis says left lateral recumbent and watch the airway. Ooh, nice. And I think that, that's exactly what I did. So I got a mattress. I put him on the you know floor on his side against the wall so he couldn't roll over. And then I told his friend to stay up with him. Is that okay, Taylor? I, you probably don't even know that story. He was my boss. That was all that happened. We all got really seasick. It was, you know, that's a, a crazy, it's a 90 hour boat trip. And uh, you're, most people are sick for about 35 hours of that. Okay, moving on from the Antarctic Peninsula. Let's go to the third place. Um, again, I had a couple months to prepare for this. Um, Sue, do you want to go to the whole Tana Glacier uh, from Cape Town, which is a 4,200 kilometer crossing to the Russian base and you're going to be the medic on at this so this plane crashed no one was killed but the Antarctica Treaty says that humans must either uh, piece that out or repair it and fly it out that that DC-3 this is the workhorse down there for the Russians the this is the workhorse that brings all the folks to the South Pole Okay, so I've got a couple months to think about it, but this is our camp from the air. We're gonna live in these tents on the Holtana Glacier for 45 days. And now I'm not with uh, folks from London, but I'm with 13 mechanics from Calgary and three Americans. Okay, what are some of the anticipated problems? What are you gonna to bring to Antarctica to manage this field crew? And we're really out there. By the way, that flight per person is $25,000 a person. Yeah. And then that only gets you to the Russian base. Then, you know, we're out here. We got flown in otters to, to this spot. <clears throat> Here's some photos. This is us landing. We're in the Arctic tents. Um, Rosie the Riveter. So really, when I started to look at that, um, I, my biggest concern was they're riveting all day to to repair, and all I could think about is things in the eyeballs. And I'm like, oh, I just don't have that skill set. I don't know what I'd do if you know if I got 
an impaled object in the eye, that'd be tough. So um, that was really probably my big concern is do, managing eyeballs down there. Well, you'd be what good about to bringing tourniquets down there too. Yeah. What's that? Tourniquets too, because all that heavy mm -hmm. machinery is someone with depression on. Oh. We're pretty good about watching for frostbite. Um, it was always about 16 degrees Fahrenheit there. It'd warm up to 30 degrees during the heat of the day. We were there in their sun, summer. Um, it was a dry camp. That helps. Well, the the one thing I would say, we got stuck at Cape Town for a week before because the weather was bad. So when I was getting up, with the roosters, doo -doo -doo -doo. all the mechanics were coming home from the bars at about that time. And I just thought, oh no, they've been doing this for a week. So I looked at them all and I said, listen, you guys, if you get a sexually transmitted disease and now we're down in Antarctica, I don't know if I can treat that. <laughs> Cause I don't even know what I'm treating. I was so mad at those guys. Um, well, if they had one, they never came to me about it. <laughs> so, in the chat, um, Jenna says that you would need to work slowly to prevent sweating and then hypothermia. Good. That's excellent. Yeah. And we had jet, you know, the biggest hazard down there is we, our tents were heated with jet fuel and mine never worked. And I get this blowback and I'd be sucking in jet fuel. And it was pretty bad. Um, anybody else want to, um, So what do you think? We did have one medical problem. What do you think it was? Anybody want to take a guess? Turned out someone has diarrhea in the chat. And oh, someone else says trench foot. Oh, these are great. Yeah, no, none of that. It was actually alcohol poisoning. So someone was found unresponsive. You know, it's daylight there 24 hours a day. So um they snuck some booze and uh, they were unresponsive at midnight, which was still light out. And uh, so, you know, there's not much you can do there except, you know, monitor them. And then, um, yeah. So it, it is quite amazing. I mean, we, I've been to these really extreme places and, you know, it's all the simple stuff like dehydration and diarrhea. I think the only other thing I had to take care of down here in this, event is uh someone cut their leg with a their pocket knife <clears throat> you know you know it always comes up is you know do we bring aeds down there and i fought that one i said no we're not bringing any aeds down there because you know remember the chain of survival <clears throat> and we're just out in the middle of nowhere um taylor anything you want to say about this because you did a similar mission flying low okay ready to go to mount everest in the chat in a few Mike minutes Taylor says all good okay so uh the highest place i have not climbed mount everest but um i started a high altitude medical school there for the sherpas um anybody in the on the line been to everest base camp or the kumbu or climbed everest uh, let us know Nice shot. Pat McKinney in the chat says that they are going in two weeks. Oh, ah, yay. So we're going to do some good stuff here. Okay. So and Jenna um, this is Kelly Kinsley. has been to Annapurna. Are you going in the fall? It'll be beautiful. I'm jealous. <clears throat> if you want, um, call me and I'll, I can hook you up with um, some of the Sherpas and the medical doctors. So Pinzu is uh, my guide. He Ended up killing him or getting killed in the Kumbu ice fall, maybe three months after our first class I did there. So, boo. Okay. So, the part, the third part is so I'm an author, I'm an explorer, and I'm an educator. So, when I moved to Crested Butte, I started teaching wilderness medicine. Why is that? Because in my second year there, I met um, Jeff Isaac, who was the um, 
faculty advisor and the curriculum de uh, developer for Wilderness Medical Associates. And he became my mentor and he took me on this journey, you know, for now I've been on it for 25 years. So I learned a lot of my wilderness medicine from Jeff and then being in that environment um, on search and rescue and ski patrol, uh, practicing it. So I saw a need, um, it, you know, one of my passions is because I spent so much time in third world countries in geology, like these are my people. I love, because I'm not a doctor either, but you know, uh, the Wilderness Medical Associates curriculum makes medicine so easy. So I figured if I can learn it, I can teach it to folks who, you know, English is their third language. So one of my clients, um, when I was teaching said, Sue, I have a guiding company in Mount Kilimanjaro. Will you teach a wilderness medicine course to my guides? So I went there. Um, that was my first trip overseas teaching wilderness medicine. Now, what do you guys need to know about Mount Kilimanjaro? It's the most dangerous mountain for Westerners to climb. They used to have like 50 deaths a year. It's a really dangerous. It's just under or over 19,000 feet. But for example, uh, the lower picture, there's 13 clients, and this is the kind of crew um, that it takes to get people and their things up to 19,000 feet. Um, so I went up there first to see what was going on, and then how could I teach them? Where were their deficits? Why are people, you know, dying up there? Well, what I learned is the Africans live in the jungle. They don't like the cold. And just so, again, basic hygiene, just going back to this basic stuff, carbon monoxide poisoning is a big one for the locals. And then the one thing they can do is that they have, you know, they be, need to be able to put on oxygen to anyone with their eyes shut. So oxygen's good for any. So I taught there for a couple of years and um, sure enough, the first trip up the mountain, actually the woman who's sick, she is a physician and she's got, you know, probably moderate high altitude cerebral edema. I mean, she's throwing up. So you can see, you know, we're training these guys to put the oxygen on. So if you were up there, I think we're at 16,000 feet, the weather's bad and this whole group dynamic thing, you know, we know that, the, the right treatment might be to go down, but, you know, maybe do we try to stay in place and treat? Um, how would you guys treat someone in place here? It's four in the afternoon, it's gonna get dark and they've got moderate haste. And you guys, most of you guys are physicians. So you've got your all your drugs and things. Anybody wanna share how they would treat this? Christopher Davis in the chat says Dex. Okay, good. What's and the Jenna dose? Says dexamethasone. Yeah. So dexamethasone, you know, try to get them some water on board, uh, oxygen, and then, yeah, then you you know, then group dynamics is a whole nother logistical problem in doing wilderness medicine. Do you split up? Do you stay together? Do you all go down? Um, I think we had enough people on this trip that we took two competent guides carrying oxygen um and she went down and the rest of us kept going and then the other photograph here and now I'm, it's the same trip and i'm dealing with pulmonary edema um you know he's kind of sitting up a little bit he's starting to cough and it's only going to get worse so what would you do for high altitude pulmonary edema maybe from mild to moderate symptoms now and you're at fifteen thousand feet in the chat, Jonathan says, can they walk? Better to go down in the dark with them walking than wait until morning and have them carry and have to carry them down. Good. So what um meds would you give if you need if maybe you help heard some crackles, a few crackles on on your stethoscope? Christopher Davis says dexmethasone descend and oxygen. So not dex, but what's that pulmonary drug? Jonathan says nifedipine. Jenna says GTN. Okay, we'll get there. I'll I'll show you the slides here in a minute. So um I took this program and then I did um seven courses in the Kumbu in Nepal. Um this is a great story because these guys, um, I worked also with the Kumbu Ice Climbing School. The um oops. Ooh, where'd it go? So um 
these guys have gone on now to know how to take care of themselves, their partners, their families, their patients. Um, they now have an intact Mount Everest search and rescue team. A lot of these guys who came three to four times to my class um, and they're international guides flying all over, taking people all around the world. So um, I, that, that's a proud moment doing that. So going back to uh, altitude illness, um, we have haste and hape, and then you can get these other effects. So swelling is the problem. <clears throat> and going to the Kumbu, you can see mild, moderate, severe. You know, I worked in Crest de Their clinic was at 9,500 feet. People skied to 12,000 feet. We might have seen mild haste. That's probably pretty much all you see in Colorado for the most part. Sometimes moderate if people are at 14,000 feet. Um, you know, but we try just try to get people down as fast as we can. So there's the, um, the treatment. Um, acetazolamide, the big altitude drug. I've never taken it. I just try to stay hydrated and urinate every two to three hours while I'm in the field. Okay, I'll just keep going. Um, this is kind of the uh, Mount Kilimanjaro rescue. They, when I was there, they didn't have any helicopters. Um, pulmonary edema. We saw actually in Crested Butte at 9,500 feet, we saw quite a bit of pulmonary edema. I got a lot of experience working around mild to moderate and sometimes severe pulmonary edema. Um, so what we were doing at the clinic most in the early days was um, oxygen and bring them down to Gunnison, like which was 600 feet lower. Um, and then they'd stay down there till they felt better and then they'd come back up with oxygen. One of the tricks you guys um, for allowing the Sherpas to rec or the Africans to recognize pulmonary edema I said, all you need to do at night when people go to bed and they're laying down, you know, if you have fluid in your lungs, you're not going to lay down. And what do people do when they start to get fluid in their lungs? They cough. So I go, all you have to do, you're going to do these checks in the evening and in the morning, and you're just going to walk around each tent. They won't even know you're there. And you're going to start listening to who's starting to cough. And then you start to hear people cough. Okay, you got to put your antenna up. And now once you see people, they're getting a little sick and they're coughing. Now, what could the cough be from? Yes, it could be from pulmonary edema, but what else causes coughing? Right, all the things. Disease. Yeah, what else? Uh, dry air at altitude, Jonathan says in the chat. Yep, what else? Asthma. The yes. coughing. Yeah, young fires, the dust on the trail. So this stuff starts to compound and get complicated, just like everything on those other missions. So I'm a fan of wearing a mask, keeping it moist, um, staying hydrated, douching your nose, and trying to avoid just the the basic respiratory system problems. Because it does get complicated. Um, you know, what are you treating? And, you know, <clears throat> and at their level of training, it's difficult. Okay, and then we do have a question the in the chat if you would be willing to answer. Kat asks, how do you differentiate between more severe HAPE and a regular cough from dry air? Well, so yeah, so you know, the classic pulmonary edema from altitude would be that they're coughing up pink frothy stuff, right? Because they're busting up capillaries. So what do you do? You know, and sometimes, it, you know, ideally stethoscopes are so cheap, just always carry one when you go to Colorado or you go to high altitude, because then you can listen to, to lung sounds to see if it's pulmonary edema. But sometimes, you know, we don't know. And you might give them antibiotics because you're thinking they're, they're getting a respiratory infection and it gets tricky. Yeah. So I would say, you know, listening for lung sounds and if they're cough, coughing up pink stuff. 
God, that's not even a right medical term. Oh, that's so bad. This is the uh, Mount Kilimanjaro helicopter, FYI. Have a plan when you go there. All right. So it's on the hour. Um, and I don't want to take too much of your time. I was just going to go into a little bit of medical uh, avalanche medicine, or I could just do my closing remarks. How's everyone doing? I know we had a request earlier for some avalanche. If you would be willing to go into a little bit of avalanche and then we could, we could. Wrap you guys up. got 10 minutes in you? We got another keep going in the chat. I think we're, I think we're good for another 10 minutes. Okay. So, yeah. Um, all right. So does anybody have any questions or anything they want to share about high altitude medicine? Um, that was just a, a quick um, overview. Okay. So this is me. Uh, I live in Northwest Montana and people get caught and killed in um, snow immersion problems. So tree well problems. So I double ejected out of my skis and I flew into this tree well and I was completely covered. Luckily, uh, my partner basically stopped right on top of my head and she heard me go Rrr! and she's like, Sue. And I'm like, Rrr! I couldn't even move. And she dug me out. All right. So uh, those are the awful little things that'll get us here in, in the Pacific Northwest. Here are the statistics. Okay. I went on quite a few avalanche recoveries and with my dog and, you know, all I ever saw was trauma. So, you know, these are worldwide statistics. So, um, you know, and people getting caught in buildings in, you know, Europe and things like that, but it seems like in the mountains, most people are going to die from trauma. Okay. Or I mean, yeah. So anyway, those are the statistics worldwide. Here's the uh, burial recovery numbers. And over the past couple of years, there's, you know, there's been some avalanches like in Idaho where someone lived like a, for like at least 90 minutes or 120 minutes under the snow. So yay, he's part of that 3%. So just remember, if you are out backcountry skiing or even in a ski area and, and someone gets buried in an avalanche, the minute you leave, you're leaving them for dead, you need to find them, okay? Search and rescue teams find dead people, not live people. Well, keep this stuff really simple. Treat what you see just like a drowning. Respiratory failure is probably going to be the primary problem. Get an airway open. And some anticipated problems would be increasing ICP because of trauma or hypoxia. <clears throat> and initially, hypothermia is not an issue. So what do you carry in your, you know, backpack, even on a big snowy storm cycle at a ski resort? What are you going to carry with you in case somebody gets into a tree well or gets clobbered by an avalanche, even inbounds or out of bounds? Thoughts. But think about our backpacks or, you know, our first aid kits are going to be like this big in the winter or on our bike or hiking. You know, we can't carry much. Have one of those emergency blankets for after you dig them out, you can wrap them in the mylar. Yeah, I'm a fan of, of, you know, what's really the dirt bag way. You guys know what dirt bags are, the cheap thing. Um, go get a big DOT Department of Transportation garbage bag, the orange ones. They're three bucks. And that's like windproof, waterproof, helicopter proof. Um, I'm not a fan of the Mylar things because they can rip with the tree branch gets on them. Um, so that is the my first layer. I have like my big garbage bag that's super thick and I can use it as my tent. What else are you carrying? Well, that's more of my survival. But about first aid for. In the chat, we have two people saying shovel. Okay. What about for medicine? Medical kit. Let's keep these kits tight. Tourniquet, right? In case somebody gets sliced by something. And maybe a pocket mask. Okay. Fair enough and then have a way to survive 24 hours out. So your big garbage bag, something to sit on and your puffy, which is, yeah, your down coat. And that could be in a stuff sack. 
So in the winter, that's really, you know, especially with, you know, I'm a ski guide. I just, my first aid kit's pretty small. Tourniquet to stop a major bleed and pocket mask. And then survival gear, really food, food and, you know, calories. This is a new slide. Uh, this is in our 2023 slide. Circumrescue collapse. I'll let you guys read this. So this is interesting. Um, <clears throat> people might be alive because of the hydrostatic pressure of the snow. And then when you release that pressure, like the snow, they can start to either have lightheadedness or they can go into cardiac arrest. So kind of like cold water, go ahead. So what, what does the recovery look like for circle rescue collapse? I don't know. This is a brand new slide. So um, Dr. Will Smith from Jackson Hole is our physician advisor. So we'll probably have a, um, a talk about that. You know, this is probably from a lot of the Alaska data. Um, so we're saying keep people horizontal, kind of like, uh, cold water immersion problems. You know, you want your body to be horizontal because the minute you tip them up, they're going to lose perfusion pressure. Um, so that's the first time I've seen this slide. So I thought I'd throw it in there. <clears throat> and then, you know, what you're out in the field and you come across somebody and you're like, oh, CPR, yes or no. We're saying do not resuscitate. Obviously, if the re rescuer is at risk and or lethal trauma, we're saying you've been buried for 35 minutes and the airway's packed. Or the body core temperature is 10 degrees C and that's about 50 Fahrenheit. So there, you know, one thing you can get if you're like an expedition doc or um, is a indoor outdoor radio shack thermometer. It's got a big long line, they're not that expensive. But if you're running into these folks out there, um, it's great to get a rectal temperature um, to get gathered data because there's just not a lot of information about body core temps um, in these extreme environments. Any questions on avalanche medicine? That was five minutes or less. I did survive the tree well burial. There I am walking out. Woohoo. So to summarize, um, I wanted to say, um, the nice thing about wilderness medicine is I have all these families all over the world. So a couple months ago, I was in uh, at the School of Mines in Golden teaching a class. And if you guys have been there, you know, in Golden, there's the Sherpa restaurant, right? So these two guys, Danuru and Panuru, are the king of the Kumbu. Together, they probably climbed Everest 50 times. They're brothers. They've been to three or four of my wilderness medical classes in their, at their home in um, the Kumbu. And they were, they're both working and serving me food and beverages at the Sherpa that's <laughs> strong I mean it's just so funny right so they're trying to get their you know green cards and they're traveling all over the world you know to the seven summits and they're just you know they open their heart and their home to me and um so the, these are the special moments of life this is why we do what we do because you know we want to help people and um and in some level they're helping us as well um and then my promise to Tasha, remember I asked her in the beginning, how would you like to be a dog that saved lives, never to leave anyone behind? Well, we filled that promise. We never left anyone behind. So she was a good, good naughty dog. Um, and then this is a reminder to all of you. Um, 
you guys are working hard. You know, my, my message to you is, is I want you guys to take really good care of yourselves. Keep your hearts open. You guys are healers, but you also need to be healed. Um, and thank you for, for doing what you do. Cause it's not easy. Make sure you laugh a lot and get out and have fun. So what's next? Maybe this. So I told you, um, I'm an Explorers Club member and this is the ship that's uh it's kind of a mimic of Darwin's sail voyage. And for two years, this vessel's going around the world, retracing Darwin's um journey. There's 36 stops. And so there's one space on this ship per stop for an Explorers Club member. So I applied. I spent a week applying for this darn position. So I'm gonna find out any day if I get to kind of do wilderness a little wilderness medicine and report on, you know, the citizen science expedition. So that's what's next for me. That's pretty cool, huh? Um, and then this is, anybody want to share what you want to go find? What's your next go find? No! There's someone there's someone holding your book up in the in their uh, um, little screen <laughs> yeah and if you you know um piley if you got her name there her uh, she just had a canine book come out so make sure you go google her name and get the book so this is um if you have, if you have any questions um you need to reach out to me this is where you can uh, find me um Any Wonderful. other questions? Anybody want to say anything? Share. Thank you so much for that amazing, amazing presentation, Susan. Uh, amazing stories, some fantastic medicine, and really, really appreciate you taking time out of your, your day to come speak with us. Well, you're so welcome. Everybody who is on the, the chat, on the message, I will be dropping three links in the chat. I will be dropping our GoMe website, I will be dropping Susan's website, and I will also be dropping our, our link for our Pit Viper giveaway. So make sure to check out those three links. We will be posting this um, on our YouTube channel in the next week or so. So if you have any friends who'd be super interested to hear Susan speak, please send them the link and they can hear the this lecture in the future. Thank you everybody for coming. And Susan, you have a whole bunch of people saying thank you to you in the chat. Have a nice night, folks. Good job, Jeff. <laughs> Thank you for everything you did. Katrina, if you're, are you still recording or have you finished the recording? Uh, I can finish it right now. <laughs>